All right, this is another lecture on the history of 1301 in the United States. Uh, this lecture covers the administrations of Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and so forth vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with uh, France, Britain, and foreign policy. Uh, in a previous lecture, you watched uh, the uh, about how important France was. France is the largest nation, at least as far as armies and economy is concerned, in the 19th century, or arguably on the economy, but certainly one of the largest nations, one of the most uh, valuable uh, militarily dominant nations in the 19th century in Europe. <coughs> and Great Britain also is, of course, a, a big nation, and we are much, much smaller. Uh, from the outset, uh, the uh, U.S. presidential uh, presidency is going to be dealing with the French Revolution and how to respond to it. Uh, George Washington's administration, for the most part, is going to try to take a hands-off and a distant approach to the whole matter and to keep us out of foreign entanglements. That was his term in his farewell address. Uh, though you're going to have the, uh, the, the turmoil and the hubbub of Citizen Gannett, uh, and others, Washington steers a, a, a neutral course as best he can to stay out of and prevent the United States getting sucked into that awful conflagration. And that's probably one of the greater contributions he makes as president. But Washington's two terms end in 1796, 1797, when he uh, formally uh, leaves the office. Uh, he does not seek a second, or rather a third term, and in 1796 the election is going to be between the sitting Vice President John Adams and the uh, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> both men are representing the two political parties of the time period, and both men have very different views on what the French Revolution means, at least at this point in time in their historical lives. John Adams is a Federalist, and John Adams is going to take the, the uh, more uh, traditional British uh, view. He's pr probably said more pro-British in the great struggle between the French and the British, whereas Thomas Jefferson, who himself had spent time, uh, Adams had spent time in France as well as a diplomat, but Jefferson himself had spent time more recently in France as uh, the chief American diplomat uh, to France, and uh, Jefferson had seen the outbreak of the revolution, and at that point in time, at least uh, prior to maybe the reign of terror, Jefferson, it could be said, uh, was uh, kind of uh, rose-colored glasses, utopian-minded with regard to what are the effects of, the, great, of uh, the revolution. Is it good for society? Is it bad for society? And he said the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the the tree of liberty must be watered with the blood of patriots from time to time. It is a natural manure. But uh, Jefferson can also be uh, oftentimes very breezily dismissive of the, the great effect of, uh, of the war in society. Anyways, all that to say, though, is, is that uh, uh, the, this is going to be the major political issue. How do we handle it? And so not only do we have to worry about it on the diplomatic front, but on the maritime front, you're going to see uh, many American ships that are going to be captured and uh, the sailors pressed into service, either into the French or into the British uh, navies. The fact of the matter is is that uh, you see uh, Adams try to maintain a neutral course, and uh, at times he's going to be sending uh, agents over to uh, France, now trying and to Britain trying to negotiate us out of this situation or that. You're also going to see what's called the XYZ affair. Uh, it has to do with some uh, proposed bribes that were to be paid, and Americans find out about it, and it goes the the, sl the slogan goes, uh, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Uh, all that to say, though, is, is that when we talk about the presidencies and the presidencies of Washington, which I've already said to you in a previous lecture, that I think Washington's pre uh, presidency is a very great one, uh, John Adams's is not so much, and it has to do with the fact that he is just not well suited to that office. Uh, Adams is a far better diplomat and a far better uh, founding father. He's very irascible, very cranky, very opinionated. Whereas, uh, and all men to some degree have to are in that office have that quality about him. But Adams wears his principles and he wears his personality on his sleeve, and that gets him into trouble uh, with his uh, political opponents and political friends. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is working behind his back. 
uh, Adams really doesn't uh, handle the office very well. In fact, it, for a long period of time, Adams tries to run the presidency as if it were like Washington, like he was Washington, kind of this uh, great uh, neutral figure with ideas, but bringing everybody in, and it just isn't going to work. Because uh, Jefferson, on the other hand, in Madison, who is now very closely aligned with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, that is, uh, James Madison is closely aligned with Jefferson, and they represent what is called the Democratic Republican Party. Very much more Francophile, uh, very much more France-oriented, sympathetic to the French Revolution, even if not the excesses of it. Uh, and they have their views on what needs to be done and uh, how to uh, sideline the Federalist. This gets back to that issue that I've raised with you before about the Federalist Party versus the Democratic Republican Party. What are their main views? What are their main thoughts? How they uh, view society, view the role of the government, view foreign policy, and foreign policy is going to be a big issue here. <coughs> but Adams' administration is also going to be beset not just by foreign policy. It's going to hurt him, however, with the public is that he and his Federalists are going to uh, pass uh, alien and sedition acts, basically, which make it uh, illegal to criticize uh, and to uh, to to well, may I say criticize, but to imprint uh, and to sla uh, criticize the U.S. government to slander, and some folks will be put in jail for it. Now, you may say that there was a First Amendment in char in on the books at that point in time, and there was. But the First Amendment in 1798 is not the same, uh, does not have the same stature or reverence or awe uh, that it does in 2020. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, it's going to be one of the, the dark marks upon Adams' administration. It is fair to say he kept us out of war with France or kept us out of war with Britain when many others would have uh, charged off to a, probably a disastrous war. Uh, <coughs> while others stayed home and fought against it and ripped the country apart. Uh, but I think uh, in the scheme of things, Adams' presidency is, is uh, at best mediocre, uh, but mostly because I just uh, I think he flailed about. He was just not seated, suited for that office. Just not, uh, it was not meant there to be. But anyways, moving the uh, timeline along, we need to get to Thomas Jefferson's administration. Uh, in 1800, Thomas Jefferson, uh, vice president to uh, John Adams, is going to run for his own <coughs> run again uh, once more against Adams. Adams and Jefferson had been great friends uh, during the Revolution and in the early days of the Republic. But as time uh, passes on, Adams and Jefferson become embittered enemies. Uh, and for the longest time, they maybe arguably say hate each other. And uh, But that, that eventually will fade out uh, at the end of their lives where they exchange a series of wonderfully, uh, pub eventually public letters uh, discussing history and their roles in the revolution and so forth. But anyways, with Jefferson and Adams in 1800, it's really in a big year. And the nickname for this election, this is one of the elections you ought to remember in history, American history. Uh, it is called the election of 1800. It is more particularly called the revolution of 1800 because Jefferson is going to win. And the question really is going to become, <coughs> will Adams try to hold on for dear life as, a, uh, as president? Is he going to willingly give up power? Will the Federalists willingly give up power to the Democratic Republicans? And in essence, will there be a peaceful exchange of power between the political factions in the country? Uh, that normally doesn't happen. You don't see that in Mexico uh, in its early days. You don't see that in other nations uh, even to this day. Uh, you will see this uh, in the United States, and so it is a credit to Adams. But that is, uh, to all that to say, though, is that the election of 1800 is one of the nastiest and dirtiest elections in the history of the country. Uh, 2016 was certainly dirty, and we're going to talk about 1828 in a future lecture. But the election of 1800 was f nasty. And basically, Adams' people said that if you elect Thomas Jefferson, the churches will be burned, uh, rape will become uh, legal, and oh, by the way, Thomas Jefferson sleeps uh, with one of his slaves, uh, a woman named Sally Hemings. All that to say is, is that <coughs> there was a whole lot of mud flown, thrown around in 1800. But it was a fairly convincing and a fairly uh, heavy, it was, there was not much uh, local individual voting in that time period, but it was a very big victory for Jefferson. And Jefferson comes into office as president of the United States. Jefferson does. Uh, with reg and there's also the issue of Aaron Burr in the background. I'll let you read that in your textbook or online. Uh, but the fact is, is that Ad Jefferson wins, and does Adams try to hold on? And he does not. 
Now, Adams uh, gets up and leaves early the morning of, of Jefferson's, and, uh, Jefferson's inauguration. Adams does not stay around for the swearing in. Adams, in fact, kind of famously gets into a public coach and he rides off uh, as uh, still actually as president with a bunch of citizens leaving a very primitive Washington, D.C. The fact is, is that Jefferson in uh, 1801, Jefferson is going to set a very different tone for the presidency. He's going to set a very different tone for the uh, for the the American nation, and in fact, it's going to very much uh, be a westward-looking uh, th theme for Jefferson's presidency. Jefferson's presidency is uh, big and important because, uh, amongst other things, <coughs> it is Jefferson who is not going to take out and punish his political enemies. So the next step in this great revolution, the next step in this great revolution for uh, the American Republic is does Jefferson publish, rather pu punish, his, uh, his enemies? And the answer is Jefferson basically does not. Jefferson will fire the worst of the Federalists, and Jefferson will cashier them and push them out of office. However, he does not wholesale either arrest, especially that that's extreme. He does not arrest, and he certainly doesn't uh, just fire all his enemies and hire his friends, as you might see later with what's called the rotation or the spoil system. Uh, it is to say, though, is that Jefferson, however, can read a map, though. And Jefferson can read a map and sees that the United States is kind of uh, has a, a westward flank hanging in the air. Uh, the westward boundary of the United States is the Mississippi River. And in 1800, 1801, the nation that owns the Mississippi River and owns all that land west of the Mississippi is going to be, well, it's first Spain, and now it's going to be France. And so by 1803, Jefferson, who can, like I said, read a map, is wanting to acquire a boundary, a buffer on the west bank of the Mississippi River. It's fair to remember that in uh, as early as the 1780s, uh, shortly after the war was over, uh, the fact of the matter is is that there was already westward movement in the United States. Lots of that great go westward movement. One of the uh, areas I'm going to speak of for just a moment has to be the state of Ohio. Ohio will be one of the biggest states in the Union, and Ohio is also going to uh, be a major, uh, a major stopover point for people headed westward. Uh, in the 1780s, uh, Ohio is uh, is about to uh, uh, begin is about to really take off, and it is growing slowly, but then picks up, and people get what is called Ohio fever, and they're headed westward. It's for worth remembering, and please make note of this, that Ohio was originally settled first and foremost by the uh, by the New Englanders, by folks from Massachusetts, Manasseh Cutler uh, and Rufus Putnam, two examples right there, were prime movers and shakers in getting the Northwest Ordinance uh, passed and getting uh, the seedlings, as it were, of Ohio started. And then people like seeds blowing in the wind, they keep going westward and westward. Ohio, of course, its southern boundary sits along the Great River, the Ohio River, and Ohio takes on some of the trappings and some of the appearances of New England with a western flair. Uh, that's important to remember because that Northwest Territory, uh, that great settling of Ohio westward all the way to Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, and Iowa for that matter as well, <coughs> is going to uh, be slave free. And I haven't talked about slavery all that much during the semester, but this is the first little, uh, the, one of the few inklings that you should note, that uh, the Continental Congress in 1786-87 is going to pass that Northwest Ordinance and declare slavery off limits to everything in that, in that territory. Ohio is established. Ohio is, uh, is uh, going and is a growing concern. But it has a very definite overtone of New England. But just right across the river, if you know your geography from Ohio, is the state of Kentucky. One of the first states of the Union, like Ohio, to be admitted after the original 13, Kentucky is settled by Virginia and is very much Virginia in its uh, outlook and, uh, and its uh, economic system. And it also, of course, has slaves. Uh, so in that sense, always just keep that in the back of your mind. Ohio is free uh, and is a Northwest Territory. Kentucky is a Virginia-dominated, uh, two different groups, but they're all these settlers are flowing westward. 
Kentucky, eventually Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois, go west, go west, go west. And so Jefferson, back to our main point, Jefferson can look around and see that the United States is growing. In fact, exploding by 1801, 1802, 1803. And all that trade that is going to be going out of the United States, because we're going to want to trade, that's part of the English system. Uh, to this day, how do you get rich? By trade. And one of the ways you do it is by sending uh, raw product or, uh, or crop or whatever goods down the Ohio River, which if you know your maps and such, you know the Ohio River connects <coughs> there in Missouri into uh, the Mississippi River and then flows southward as this gigantic artery, the, the, the father of waters as Abraham Lincoln calls it. Uh, it goes southward all the way to New Orleans and south of there into the Gulf of Mexico. The... the Rivers. Now this would be the Missouri, this would be the Ohio, this would be the Mississippi, and later the canals that connect them all. All those rivers plus the canals and later railroads still are going to help facilitate trade to go down that river, go through New Orleans, and get out into the wider world. If you're the United States and you're Thomas Jefferson, you want to control that river, you want to have that river lock, stock, and in American hands. You want New Orleans in your hands because that is going to be the great port. And that's true to this day. Regardless of whether there's a hurricane or something else that wrecks New Orleans out, there will always be a city at or near the mouth of the Mississippi River because of the amount of barge traffic then as now that go up and down the river. So all that's uh, worth noting there. When we talk about the uh, Mississippi River, the desire for a buffer, wa uh, Washington, D.C., now President Jefferson wants to control it. And so Washington, gosh, excuse me, uh, Jefferson is going to send a good number of uh, about three delegates or three diplomats to France uh, to uh, ask about and to uh, see if they can purchase from France, Napoleon now, to purchase from Napoleon a buffer on the west bank of the Mississippi River, a buffer about 50 to 100 miles wide. So we control the river, we control the land on the other side of the river, we've got that free and clear. Uh, these American diplomats, Robert Livingston amongst them, are going to uh, come into contact with some old hands of French uh, uh, diplomacy. Some of them are as grizzled uh, as an old uh, grizzly steak. <coughs> one man is a, one of the great uh, survivors, and this guy's name is uh, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. Now, Mar Talleyrand uh, is an ultimate survivor. In the early days of his diplomatic career and his service to the French uh, people and government and crown, he is a, a royalist. When uh, the revolution gets underway, he changes his stripes, he changes his colors, and he becomes a, uh, well, not a royalist. He becomes a, uh, what would you say, um, he becomes a revolutionary. And then when Napoleon becomes the emperor, well, he's Napoleon's man. And when Napoleon looks like he's getting long in the tooth and he starts to fall, he stabs Napoleon in the back. Uh, and speaking of him and Napoleon, Napoleon is going to uh, say about uh, Talleyrand, that at first they, they, they had a great affair, love affair. I don't mean that literally. They had a great working relationship. Napoleon thought much of Talleyrand, thought very highly of him. Later on, as the relationship sh uh, soured and uh, the emperor and one of his chief diplomats no longer see eye to eye on many things, uh, he, Napoleon, referred to uh, Talleyrand as a silk stocking filled with mud. And so, uh, anyways, all that to say, though, is, is that Talleyrand, amongst others, meets with American diplomats, and these American diplomats start talking about the, the necessity of purchasing this buffer, and the French uh, more or less go on to say, and, and just stop the discussions right there and say, why talk about a part of Louisiana when you can buy the whole thing? And so the Americans, after picking their jaws up off the floor, have to make a decision, and the answer is, should we go well beyond what we're authorized to do and purchase all of Louisiana? Now, if you're thinking Louisiana in 1803 is just that little boot that is uh, to the east of Texas, no, no, Louisiana extends all the way up to and past the northern border of the United States into present-day Canada. It is essentially that old LaSalle claim of the watershed of the Mississippi River. Going beyond that, 
does Louisiana even include Texas? Because that's all part of the figuring. And France has control of, the, of Louisiana because of what's called the retrocession of Spain into France. Spain, because Spain fell under the orbit of Napoleon, Spain gives back uh, Louisiana to, to France. Napoleon, for a brief period of time, considered Louisiana as a new French um, uh, colonial empire. He gives up on that. He needed the money. <coughs> and so he's willing to sell us all of that open territory, that open land. So it's a massive purchase. And so the Americans say, yes, we'll do it. Numbers, of course, are 15 million. 15 million for uh, all that acreage, uh, and basically works out to approximately three cents an acre. What's most important to remember, though, is, is that the U.S. government in 1803 is tiny. Our budget is tiny, and 15 million dollars is twice or a little more than twice the annual budget of the United States government. So where do we get the money from? Do we tax our way out of it? No. And oh, by the way, Jefferson has to swallow some of his constitutional principles to purchase this land because the Constitution does not explicitly say you can purchase land. But he swallows it and uh, we're all the better for it. All that to say is, is that what is that, uh, that, that uh, gr cr uh, growing need? What is that? Where do we get our money from? Well, we're going to borrow it. We're going to borrow the money from a bank. And it's uh, the predominant lender here is going to be called the Bering Brothers Bank. B-A-R-R-I-N-G, Bering, Bering Brothers Bank. The Bering Brothers Bank is a big, big concern in, in Europe. It's in, more particularly in London. It is the biggest of the banks of London. It's a grant of the great lenders of all of Europe and in North America. And in fact, the joke was at the time period, that there were, what, seven great powers in Europe, uh, Russia, Prussia, France, Britain, Austria, uh, and, uh, oh gosh, probably Spain and Bering Brothers. So the joke was basically that it was a bank that was on par with a nation state. So we're going to borrow a wad of cash from Bering Brothers, and we're going to take that wad of cash and then give it to Napoleon in exchange for Louisiana. Now, remember in 1803, what is Napoleon doing? Some of you remember from the lecture you just finished watching recently was that Napoleon was locked in a death struggle uh, by that point in time with the British. So it's the so basically that cash that Napoleon now has in his pocket is going to be used to fight and possibly kill or invade England. It was a scandal. It would be as if in, say, the Second World War, a third nation borrowed money from a New York bank uh, that in turn gave the money to Germany. I mean, or gave it, yeah, borrowed money, uh, that in turn gave it to Germany to use against uh, the United States in the World War. All that to say is, is it was scandalous. But uh, money is uh, thicker than water, it seems at times. It's maybe even thicker than blood. But uh, that's certainly what I've been reading uh, The Prince lately. And uh, uh, Machiavelli would say that uh, a man forgives the uh, killing of his father faster than he does the taking of land. So maybe there's some truth in that. All that to say, though, is that Bering Brothers will be able to survive. And when Napoleon and France collapse after Napoleon is driven from power for the final time, it was Bering Brothers who loaned uh, France the money to pay back reparations to Britain. And oh, by the way, and Bering Brothers got richer in the process. So it's one of the great banking houses in all of Europe and especially there in London. But when we talk about Bering Brothers and we talk about the purchase of Louisiana and all those wonderful acres, you've got to go out there and figure out what you've got. And, of course, the man who's going to be, or the, the, the operation that's going to go find it is, uh, or figure out what we have, is the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, it's a great story. I'm not going to get into it. Time is uh, becoming of the essence to me as far as this course is concerned. But I do want you to note that Lewis and Clark is going to travel over the span of about 18 months going out and back. And, oh, by the way, uh, they get to the Pacific Ocean. It's kind of like going to the moon in a sense. All that to say, however, is, is that Jefferson's administration, on the one hand, is going to be very good. Uh, Jefferson easily wins re-election in 1804. By 1804, it's starting to become obvious that the Federalist Party has got some real fundamental issues. Uh, it doesn't have a base beyond New England. Uh, it's very uh, loca it's located in New England and New York, and that's about where the Federalists end at. Jefferson is a popular person. He comes across as unpretentious, even though he is, in his own right, very pretentious. Uh, 
but as the years go on, Jefferson's first term is glorious and great. Uh, we talked about that. But in the second term, it's really going to be a, a bad term. Sometimes it may be said the, the, the president's best term uh, is his first term. It's almost always his first term. His second term is the one that is uh, a wreck and it's a mess. Oftentimes that's true. And it was true for Je uh, Jefferson because he's going to, it's the, uh, the revolution and more particularly the fighting between Napoleon and England that's going to suck more oxygen out of his administration. It's going to really uh, dis depose uh, and stop his, uh, his momentum, uh, Jefferson's momentum. Uh, and in fact, Jefferson issues uh, some very, uh, I say issues, but Jefferson gets the Congress in 1807 to issue some very, uh, bad pieces of legislation blocking all trade with France and Britain called the Embargo Act. And it basically shuts down the New England economy and embitters many uh, of Jefferson's erstwhile supporters against him uh, and, and against uh, being involved in these sorts of things. Just let us trade, let us make money, but why an Embargo Act? Well, there was a whole lot of, uh, of uh, pressing of sailors. There was a, it was a gambit. Uh, on the diplomatic side, it fails and fails miserably. And so by the time Jefferson leaves office after his two terms, uh, and he stands down and goes back to Monticello in western Virginia, outside of Charlottesville, uh, the fact is, is that once Jefferson uh, goes and leaves, uh, he goes and leaves politics forever, uh, except for letters and such like that. Uh, but he leaves, and he's not a loved man. But the Federalists are still so weak, they can't get their own man in, they can't take advantage of the situation, and James Madison steps to the forefront uh, and runs. So the the uh, so the fact of the matter is is that when we talk about uh, Jefferson's presidency, his first term was great. Uh, he uh, scores actually I didn't mention this, but he scores a victory also over the Barbary pirates. Uh, he does a, a good job handling the office of the presidency, reducing it, uh, and so forth. Uh, I think overall, but that second term was highly problematic. Uh, it just didn't go so well. And it's all because of Napoleon, Great Britain, and the great di fight between the two groups. Well, anyways, uh, so we, we deal with that. But I want to, uh, before I leave Adams and Jefferson uh, off completely and move on, I do want to finish their lives off very quickly because uh, they are part of that founding generation. And by 1809, the founding generation had been uh, departing. Uh, Jeff George Washington died uh, famously of a doctor's uh, malpractice in 1799 when he got a, probably a throat infection. He probably would have survived that had they not uh, bled him to death. Uh, other uh, prominent leaders had died. Franklin was long dead. Uh, in fact, actually, Alexander Hamilton had died in the famous duel with Aaron Burr, uh, and so on and so on. But Jefferson and Adams... Uh, they did not like each other. They were very embittered toward each other, especially Adams to Jefferson. And those who knew Adams and would go visit him there in Braintree, Massachusetts, would find him well into retirement, shoveling manure and uh, shoveling hay on his farm there out in, in Braintree in Massachusetts. Uh, they would find Adams just muttering to himself with some fervency and zeal, uh, talking about Jefferson this and they did that, and he just reliving old uh, wounds that never seemed to heal. Uh, Jefferson goes back to uh, Monticello and spends the rest of his days uh, messing around with Monticello. He was always an amateur and actually a pretty good architect, expanding uh, Monticello, spending money he didn't have. Uh, Jefferson was always deep, deep, deep into debt. <clears throat> and the only reason he was never kicked out of Monticello was because he was Thomas Jefferson, father of the Declaration of Independence. But, of course, uh, Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson, is going to uh, help uh, endow and, uh, and plant the University of Virginia, one of the great institutions of higher learning in America to this day. But all, all that to say, though, is, is that when we talk about Jefferson and Adams, their relationship resumes after Jefferson leaves office. I believe it was Benjamin Rush, who was a doctor and a friend to both of them, uh, that says to uh, Adams initially says, why don't you write old Jefferson a letter? Why don't you uh, make contact? Y'all two are friends. You're both out of politics. And those two men are going to start writing back and forth to each other in a blizzard, as it were, of letters. Those two men are going to write, write, and write uh, uh, till the day they die. And uh, Adams uh, is going to be, uh, uh, his wife will leave him, not like in a divorce sort of thing, but Abigail Adams is going to die a handful of years before he does. But uh, to close this little story off, and it's a rather touching story about how two old enemies who were also friends became friends again and could reminisce on uh, what it meant uh, to be uh, founding fathers. Uh, 
both of them left a rich, rich uh, set of documents for us to read, and we get an idea of what they thought. Adams in his uh, Adams in 1826 is an old man. Adams at that point is 90 years old, maybe 91 even. Uh, and Ed Jefferson's a few years behind him, about 83, 84. And they're both in bad health. And in 1826, uh, July 4th rolls around. Now, if you think about it, July 4th, 1826, if you do a little math for me, uh, you should recognize that July 4th, 1826 is 50 years after the Declaration of Independence had been signed and uh, uh, promoted there in Philadelphia. On July 4th, 1826, in the early morning hours of the 4th, Jefferson, who was uh, doing his level best uh, to stay alive, Jefferson willed himself to stay alive to the 4th. Because that, in a sense, I think, for Jefferson, was maybe the greatest contribution he, th he thought he'd given to mankind and to his country. Uh, Jefferson kept asking in his delirium, and he was just dying, I believe, of uh, heart failure or something to that effect. Uh, he was just an old man. And he would live a long time. And Jefferson kept asking of those around his deathbed, said, is it the fourth yet? Is it the fourth? And they'd say, no, Mr. Jefferson, it's not. But about two or so in the morning, Jefferson finally came, kind of came back into consciousness and he asked the question, is it the fourth? And they said, yes, Mr. Jefferson, it is the fourth. And so with that no knowledge there, Thomas Jefferson relaxed and he released and his uh, spirit departed. Uh, he died on July 4th, 1826. Uh, unbeknownst to Thomas Jefferson and, of course, also John Adams, no uh, telephones or media or uh, mask easy communications, uh, instant communications then, up the road uh, hundreds of miles away in Massachusetts at the, at the Adams family house, there on his own deathbed was an aged John Adams who had lived into uh, the day of and in the afternoon of July 4th, 1826. And it was there that Adams uh, says uh, very clearly as his last words, Jefferson still lives. And he knew, too, it was the 4th of July, 1826. But it wasn't true. And for a man who, in the case of John Adams, whom I've always been a bit ambivalent about as a historical character, but as a man who, on the one hand, was a great founding father and a mediocrity as a president and sometimes uh, great to read about and other times frustrating and you want to choke him, John Adams was the last of the founding fathers, more particularly those who had signed the Declaration of Independence to live. And it was, Tom, it was John Adams who thought he would always be forgotten, overlooked by Washington and Franklin and others. But it was John Adams who was the last to live. And it was the two, frankly, with, in addition to Franklin, but the two principal men who had a hand in drafting and signing and writing the uh, Declaration of Independence. Adams did not write it. Jefferson did. But they were both big collaborators on that document that we know um, that today. The fact of the matter is, is that when we talk about the Declaration of Independence, those two founding fathers uh, died on the 50th anniversary of its publication in July 4, 1776. A lot of Americans, when the news reached them, whether it was sooner or later, that both men, Jefferson and Adams, died on that same, that 50th anniversary, looked upon it as a, a nod of providence, a nod of the Almighty uh, to the work that they had uh, laid their hands to. And so I would agree with that, frankly. It was a little more than some sort of mere coincidence, in my opinion. But all that to say, though, is, is that those two men exit the scene, and then the second generation is, in a sense, coming forward. Uh, and the the election of uh, James Madison to the presidency, you would think for a man who wrote the Constitution, who knew the handbook of the Constitution, had written many of the Federalist Papers, who had been a Secretary of State, it would make a good president. But that's not always true. Sometimes the men you least expect to be president uh, and make a, a decent or good president tend out to be great. Sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes you peg him pretty well, and then others you think, ah, he's got lots of training. He would make a good president in a time of crisis. Not just a Madison, as we're talking here, but say prior to the Civil War, a guy named like James Buchanan would make a great president. Well, he didn't. James Buchanan didn't, and James Madison was ill-suited for the office. And Madison was uh, just, he, he was a far greater constitutional scholar than he was a president. So, Because what, what is it that makes uh, Madison's presidency so forgettable and so busted? 
It's the thing that wrecks his second term. His first term was not great. The non-intercourse acts, Madison was completely bamboozled by the French and the British. But it is the War of 1812, the War of 1812 that is going to be the stain upon uh, Madison's administration. The U.S. government is not prepared to fight a War of 1812. We tried it. We we th threaten war. Uh, we find out that the British uh, had backed off of the, uh, the issues that we'd had with them, but we wouldn't rescind the war declaration. You've got lag times and communications going across the Atlantic Ocean. The United States is split over the War of 1812. Westerners, and this is that second generation coming forward now to lead the nation, it's Westerners such as war hawks like Henry Clay, John Calhoun, Andrew Jackson, the others that are going to be promised, Thomas Hart Benton, uh, and these are all names for the second generation. They are either in office or about to come into office or come into prominence, and they're saying, go to war to fight the British. We hate the British. We want to secure British lands. We want to aggrandize and grow the United States. The British are influencing and trying to help the Native Americans against American settlement. Out east in New England, especially in the great shipyards of Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and elsewhere, New York City, too, to a certain degree, they were opposed to war with Great Britain because economically it could mean catastrophe. It would, they had already been battered enough by the policies, policies of Jefferson uh, and later Madison, and many of the New England states basically said, if we go to war with Great Britain or with France, our boys can fight, but they can't fight beyond the borders of Massachusetts or Connecticut or Rhode Island or something like that. You will see those sorts of things there. And this country is split in perhaps a way it won't be split until, again, the Civil War and, and so on over what it means to go to war. The word secession, for the first time in American political history, after the Constitution is adopted, is going to be brought up not by Southerners, mind you, but the word secede, break the nation apart, is brought up at the Hartford Convention in 1814. And on and on we can go. And the War of 1812 is a real, real uh, disaster. And it's just, uh, there's not a lot good about it. Washington, D.C. gets burned to the ground. Uh, the militia, which was such, such ballyhooed coming out of the Revolution, which was a myth of the First Order, is going to be said to be the greatest thing to protect the country. It flees in the Blandesburg races. We hold on to Baltimore, but just barely. Uh, you have one notable uh, victory at, uh, with the USS Constitution, but otherwise, the Navy is uh, in shambles. The U.S. Army is in shambles. There's just not a lot good to go around. You have a few battles here and there that we acquit ourselves well. But when we try to invade Canada, the Canadians whip us like a, uh, beat us like a rented mule, and we do nothing. The War of 1812, I'll spend more time talking about, but the War of 1812 is also, however, going to be good because it is the beginnings of a great and new, uh, the second generation is going to start to really take hold and take uh, control of, uh, of American policy. And the old founding generation, slowly but surely, is good by just attrition, is going to give up and start to pass away. So... The War of 1812, not a glorious moment in our history. Uh, arguably, we uh, at best, we came to a tie. Uh, may, uh, you could say that, a draw, perhaps. Uh, really, what you could say in your notes, it's called status quo antebellum. We fight the war, we end the war, and status quo antebellum means uh, as it was before the war. So, that's to say, not to say, however, there isn't no, anything to talk about. There is Horseshoe Bend, there's Andrew Jackson, there's the Battle of New Orleans. There are some important developments that come about in this war, and this war will make men. It'll make Andrew Jackson, and that's where we pick up in the next lecture. Thank you very much.